and welcome to I Hate James Dobson, a podcast dedicated to therapist on therapist violence. <laughs> and by violence, I mean talking shit and dropping names. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone, this is Jake. My conversation with Brooke about what wives wish their husbands knew about women was so long that it was split into two episodes for time. Today, though, we are releasing the full conversation as a bonus episode for the freaks of you out there who have 90 minutes to listen to a podcast. I am one of those freaks. If you're new here, enjoy. But if you've been listening, feel free to catch us next week with a brand new episode. And now, on with the show. Welcome to I Hate James Dobson. As always, I am Jake, a marriage and family therapist, and I'm joined by the brilliant and beguiling Brooke. (laughs) Brooke, how are you? I'm doing good. I like that. Brilliant and beguiling. We love alliteration. Yeah, we do. Brooke, how are you since last we spoke about Dobson? Oh, well, uh, you know, great. I had Thanksgiving since then, and I've been able to drown away my sorrows in a bucket of gravy and turkey, and it's been fine. I don't even remember anything of that horrifying event. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we are starting with a recap. <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it. <laughs> do you remember anything from last time? Oh, yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What it's, do you remember? It's seared in there forever. Um, lots of parenting advice about toddlers. Mm-hmm. Spankings. Mm-hmm. Insolent, disrespectful toddlers that are challenging your authority. On purpose. On purpose. Yep. And, uh... Wasn't there a part where there, we were spanking some teenagers? Uh, not spanking, but inflicting physical pain, yes. Yeah, okay. You well, shouldn't spank teenagers because it hurts their feelings. Oh. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Some interesting gender things about, like, the the boys and the girls and the moms and the dads. Mm-hmm. And I think just a lot of spanking last time. It was dare to discipline, right? A lot of spanking. Yes, it was. Ow! Ow, ow. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to find out what the name of today's book is. It's it's a doozy. So I want to start with dare to discipline for a number yeah. of reasons. Firstly, it was his first book. But I also think it's a great case study for the slipperiness of his language. Discipline is good, but punishment is bad. And spanking is good in this way. And it... It just That's just not how it works. He creates such an absurd kind of closed off category to say this is what good spanking is that just is not reflective of real life. But it gets him to claim plausible deniability when people otherwise physically abuse their children. I also don't think I impressed enough of how bad a writer James Dobson is. Yeah. We, we talked a lot about his writing and I read some quotes, but he's just, he's just not a good writer. No. Uh, I think he's trying to be folksy, but he ends up just being an asshole. Like... The, he shits on kids all over the book. We talked about that. I think he's trying to sympathize with overwhelmed parents mm. by being like, yeah, aren't kids terrible? And being a parent is overwhelming. I get it. Yeah, sure. But you can do that without the punchline being, so then I hit them and they sure learned their lesson. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I don't think I mentioned is there's a part where he just outright rejects any scientific research saying that spanking is bad. He claims it's because this research doesn't give enough nuance and they're not measuring good spanking or bad spanking. It's mixed together. And like I said, that creates a level of plausible deniability for him so he can write off anything that's bad as unrelated to good spanking. It allows him to sidestep any culpability in the proven, consistent, and pervasive consequences of spanking, including the kinds that he advocates for. That's what that slipperiness of language gets at. Brooke, how many copies do you think Dare to Discipline sold? Tell me again what year this was. 1971. Oh, yeah. Mm, I would say lots. That That is correct. Yeah. 3.5 million copies. Whoa. And is in the Library of Congress. Wow. Yeah. So, like, a lot of people still have this book in their homes. A lot of people do. A lot of people did. A lot of people, even parenting experts, 
quote unquote experts today were influenced by it and continue to be influenced by it, whether they know it's directly from that or not. Wow. Passed down the pipeline. Yeah. Today's book uh, has sold about 2 million copies, so it's a little bit less popular. Uh huh. After Dare to Split. After Dare to Dis- My goodness. What's so hard to say? <laughs> you got this. <clears throat> After Dare to Discipline. Ow! <laughs> that whole thing in. absolutely <laughs> made an indelible skid mark on the underwear of parenting <laughs> advice Jake. dobson had become a celebrity he was booked for speaking engagements he appeared on trashy tv shows representing the evangelical viewpoints often opposite feminists oh yeah very much like a jerry springer like let's see these two duel it out and by god did he completely buy into his bullshit in his third book because we're skipping the second one oh we are yeah I didn't realize this wasn't his second book when I started reading it. And oh. then the second one's also about parenting advice. And I'm very tired of hearing Dobson talk about parenting Great. right now. <laughs> he turns his brand of nuance, compassion, and scientific understanding into one of the most complicated and difficult subjects in the world. Dobson is here to help all of us understand a topic that has been an enigma since time immemorial. Women. Oh no, not women. Today we are talking about the feminist manifesto What wives wish their husbands knew about women? Oh my god, I cannot wait. (gasps) It's really called What Wives Wish Their Husbands Knew... uh, What is it? I can't see it. Knew About Women. What Wives Wish Their Husbands Knew About Women. Mm Mm-hmm. That is the most convoluted title I've ever heard. Yeah. It's... The abbreviation that I have for this is WWWTHKAW, which is not really an abbreviation either. I like the idea of say, like putting the emphasis on the wrong word, like, what wives? <laughs> 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 what wives wish their husbands knew what women, what women, women. I'm so glad to have you, Brooke, on this podcast because yeah. you are an expert in women. <laughs> can see your little <laughs> shitty grin right then as you said that. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. This book was published in 1975, two years before Focus on the Family, Fadif, was formally created. <laughs> um, the last time we explored Dobson's hierarchy of parents and children, today we're going to be talking about the hierarchy within the parental system. I'm already so angry, <laughs> and nothing's even happened yet. What are Dobson's qualifications to talk about women? Zero. Well... None. No, he is married to one. Uh, he's a counselor, so he's talked to at least five women. And also, and this is a true anecdote that he tells in this story. One time, his wife broke her leg, so he had to take care of his son for one morning. Well, he tried, and then he had to ask his wife to take over for him anyway, because he got overwhelmed. Oh my god! That is a real story he tells without the faintest bit of irony. That literally as a way to be like, I get how hard being a mom can be, because I had to do it for one morning, and I couldn't even come. One morning? Yeah. Jake, am I being punished for something? <laughs> You're being punished for being my friend. Can you put more whiskey in this cup before we talk about women? You did not tell me that today we were going to be talking about women. Feminism. Feminism. He oh, hates God. feminism, I think, unsurprisingly. Oh, and this was right during the time of, like, um, uh... Uh, Betty for Dan and and Gloria Steinem and everybody. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Very, like, second wave feminism. Yeah, yeah. Which is not a great time for feminism in some cases. No, but, oh, my God. An important time. We should still, like, read and understand them, but but Dobson has a lot of ammo to kind of just twist a lot of stuff. Sure. This book is structured around a list of ten problems facing women. (laughs) Brooke, as a woman person... Uh Uh-huh. What are women's problems? More scientifically. Men. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God, Jake. Okay, well. So it's a top 10 list. So please keep your answer to a cute 10 item listicle that can be uh, absorbed by men without feeling too critiqued. (laughs) Yeah, okay. So what was the question again? Why do women want to fucking kill men? Is that, what, what was it? What are women's problems? Oh. Well, like, same question, really. What are women's problems? <laughs> okay. 
Number one, men. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, um, fear of men. Okay. Okay. Uh, number three, patriarchy in general. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, number four, uh, violence caused by men. Okay. Um, number five, uh, God, I don't know, like, never finding the right shoe size when you're trying to get new shoes. I oh guess God, that's like a so thing. hard. They never, have, <laughs> they never have heels in my stuff. They just never have half sizes, you know what I mean? Why can't they, each shoe have a different size? Just general malaise. <laughs> <laughs> Periods. Unequal, uh, like, um, pain support in, in the medical field, um, all the isms, uh, I'd say it's like 10. Phobia. I would say, and then, and then like, getting your beach body. Mm, I just started losing that, those last five pounds. Is so <laughs> um, two of those actually do, are on his list. Shoe shopping? Uh, no, surprisingly. You said general malaise. Uh, I put fatigue. Oh, 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 fatigue. Yeah. Um, and then, believe it or not, menstrual and physiological problems is on his list. Duh. I know that this bitch is going to talk about periods. I just want everyone to know that Jake gave me a little whiskey before the podcast today, so... And didn't tell me it was going to be about women. <laughs> when this motherfucker starts talking about periods, I'm going to lose my mind. It's actually... That part is not as bad as you might think. All right, good. It's... It's it's generally non offensive, although also it's a lot of like, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. okay, okay, it's still offensive. Yeah, I mean everything Dobson does is <laughs> the ten problems that he lists: low self esteem, oh my god, fatigue, yeah. time pressure, yeah, loneliness, isolation, and boredom as one. Okay, absence of romantic love in my marriage. Wrong. Well, complicated. Financial difficulties. True. Sexual problems in marriage, menstrual and physiological problems, mm. problems with children, yeah, and problems with the in-laws. <laughs> the, the top ten biggest problems in a woman's life, yes. and problems with the in-laws is on there. Yes, we'll talk more about this kind of at the end as we kind of analyze this as a whole text. But really quickly, yeah. I'm gonna have a lot to say this time. So this isn't really like top 10 problems for women. Mm. This is top 10 problems for wives. So that's what I want. One of the things I want to talk about. He uses wives, women, and housewife interchangeably. Right. And you'll find me, because I'm. I, it gets so tricky to as you're writing and reading and absorbing. You'll find me kind of alternate between them. And that's not a reflection of my personal values. And uh-huh. I'll try to be as distinct as I can. But that's just so soaked into the language of what Dobson is saying. He cannot really fathom. He doesn't want to talk to women who are not wives. Right. There's no such thing. Like, what's the purpose of that woman? Mm-hmm. I also want you to keep in mind, in the back of your head, who's the audience for this? Who mm-hmm. is he writing for? Keep that in mind. Okay. So let's talk about how Dobson created this list. He rejects science, as we talked about just a second sure. ago, and the scientific method, because the scientific method requires um, humility. And the ability to say, I was wrong, or be critiqued by your peers, and mm-hmm. Thompson doesn't want that. So he uh, started just from counseling and listening to women's stories and listening to the wives in his church. Um, and then he, in his speaking engagements, handed out a list to say, rank your top 10 problems. And he somehow got to this list and this order. We don't know anything about his sample size. We don't know anything about his It was the church wives. Yeah, it was church wives at conferences that James Dobson spoke at. So, right. like, an incredibly self-selecting example. Sure. But number one, according to this list and his flawed methods, is self-esteem. According to him, this is the number one issue that women report, wives report, uh, issues with. Okay. Quote, even in seemingly healthy and happily married young women, personal inferiority and self-doubt cut the deepest. Again, we're finding ideas of inferiority. This is back to this Adlerian kind of view. We have to overcome our sense of inferiority that we talked about in the very first episode and kind of overview of his beliefs. This comes back all the time, both in explicit ways like this and in implicit ways. Another note, he's an insufferable writer here. He says in writing this chapter that a woman in the library came up to him and said, I've been trying to find your book because I've heard it deals with self-esteem. 
I am constantly depressed over my own inadequacy, and I hoped I could find help in your writings. Oh my god. No human person talks like that. No! That's not how people speak. No! And also his god complex is so strong, my writings have helped countless women. He's just sucking his own dick. Yeah. And trying to pass it off like a folksy and no one else is sucking. Dobson says that women are depressed because we do not value housewives, which is the role that women were born to do. <gasps> Oh, God. Quote, this disease of an inferiority has reached epidemic proportions among females. Also, side note, anytime a man says females, is very <laughs> creepy vibes. Epi- epidemic proportions among females, particularly at this time in our history. Their traditional responsibilities have become matters of disrespect and ridicule. Raising children and maintaining a home hold little social status in most areas of the country, and women who are cast into that role often look at themselves with unconcealed disenchantment. Militant feminists mock women who want to be housewives. Patriarchy is ordained by God, and therefore women are most fulfilled when they are housewives, is kind of the takeaway of his. Thanks, James. Yeah. It's possible that the women have self-esteem because they are constantly being told that the only thing they're built for is to be a housewife. Mm Mm-hmm. But, okay. And also, I think there's a lot of critiques of capitalism to be made for why not being a mom and joining the workforce is also unfulfilling, right? But you not feeling fulfilled or feeling overwhelmed or whatever about being a mom is also okay. And feeling like this isn't what I wanted to do with my life is also a common experience for people, even if they think they want to be moms. Right. Life is hard and messy and complicated. Yeah. It's not because we denigrate them. There is something to be said about denigration of women's work generally. Right. None of these are are arguments that Dobson makes here. Here he also correctly asserts there's no significant difference in intelligence between men and women. Good. All right. Thanks. Despite this fact, women are much more inclined to doubt their own mental capacity than are men. Why? I don't know. You're so close, dude! You're so- Could it be that you explicitly tell women that they are inferior to men? Subservient to them? That they- That men are the head of the household and therefore they get the final say in every decision? That all these factors tell women that they aren't as smart as men? Nah. No. Who knows? That's not it. Women are crazy. Yeah, it's their periods. <laughs> He talks about how militant feminists are angry because they're projecting their inborn sense of inferiority onto men and then erroneously blaming those men. Not because patriarchy is incredibly oppressive and treats women as second-class citizens, objects, and ornaments for men. No, it's it's because they're projecting their own sense of inferiority. It's interesting that he refers to them as militant so frequently, right? Military, this man's role, right? Mm. So that puts them in this threatening position for men. It's really like his... His slippery language, like you said, is really interesting. Mm-hmm. And they're acting masculine. They're acting outside of their assigned role. Right. How dare they? And if women are asking, acting masculine, that's a threat to men. Mm-hmm. Mm. Everyone is angry these days, says James Dobson. Quote, whether it be the Black Civil Rights Advocate or the Jewish Defense League or the Gay Liberation Movement or Veterans Against the War or the 8th grade class of Woodrow Wilson Junior High School, <sighs> everyone is mad at somebody. Oh, my God. So dismissive. <laughs> he compares the entire black civil rights movement to an eighth grade class mm-hmm. of whiny junior high kids. They're just complaining. Everybody's mad. There's so much tone policing here, right? And this is unsurprising given all of his beliefs. But even last time with talking about their yeah. college kids who were having problems with their schools. And he said, whatever they said doesn't matter. It's how they said it. And we're not going to hear them if we're not going to say it in a nice way. <sighs> What this is kind of like a trite talking point in social justice circles, I suppose, but like it's not up to the person being oppressed to be nice about asking for what they need. Right. And equal rights. I just wanted to say something in case it wasn't clear. I really hate James Dobson. I hate James Dobson (laughs) with a passion. I hate him so much. All right, keep going. Quote If women genuinely respected their roles as wives and mothers, they would not need to abandon it for something better. If they, if they felt equal to men in personal worth, they would not need to be equivalent to men in responsibility. Basically, if we value the roles of wives and mothers, then women won't have yeah. to like look for jobs for personal fulfillment. I kind of agree with that. Kind of. Definitely not in the way that Dobson means it. But no. again, we devalue women's work, traditionally women's yes. work. Yes. And I do think that if we uh, treated that with more value, more people would feel more fulfilled generally. But it's not about forcing women into any one role. It's saying you should feel a sense of worth 
regardless of what you do well, with your life. Well, I think if we treated women with more value yeah. in general, regardless of whatever they're doing, mm-hmm. they they would be happier and feel more fulfilled. I don't think it's about like treating wives who want to stay mm-hmm. home with their children better. I mean, certainly uh, that is one group of women, but like mm-hmm. all, let's treat all women better. They'll all feel more fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Because they're equal. So the problem identified is uh, low self-esteem. The way to fix it, we should just be nicer to wives. We should value them more. Uh Men should be kinder to their wives. (laughs) Okay. Issue number two, fatigue and time pressure. Uh, Dobson has three ideas for men to try and understand about women here. Wonderful. Being a woman, being a, sorry, let's see. Being a mom is a tough job and it makes sense that women are exhausted by it. Let your wife vent to you and praise her for keeping your home in order. <laughs> Item two, women can understandably get overwhelmed by keeping your home in order. And three... Your home. That is my words, but that's very much the, the vibe from this. And number three, husbands and wives should constantly guard against the scourge of overcommitment. <laughs> that's, that's his advice. Men understand being a mom is tough. And also... Don't. Let that... Let that bitch vent it out. Woof. So, let's get into those points a little bit more. The first one. Let your wife vent and praise her for keeping your home in order. (laughs) Quote, "For, For some strange women, human beings, and particularly women, tolerate stress and pressure much more easily if at least one other person knows that they are enduring it. This is highly relevant to housewives. The frustrations of raising small children and handling domestic duties would be much more manageable if their husbands acted like they comprehended it at all. Everyone needs to know that he's respected for the way that he meets his responsibilities. Husbands get this emotional nutrients through job promotions, raises in pay, and annual evaluations, and incidental praise during his workday. Women at home get it from their husbands, if they get it at all. (laughs) Or other meddling hens down the street gossiping and buying their Mary Kay products. Dobson also, (laughs) throughout this, does not really differentiate between socialization and, like, inherent biological traits. Mm. And so a feminist could have written most of this as well, but taking it from, like, a social critique, women feel so isolated, especially housewives feel so isolated that they can only get praise from their husband. And, I mean, that is what you've pointed out before is the tricky thing about Dobson. It's like, he's not actually wrong about that. Like... Yes, it is isolating for anyone who stays home with children all day or mm-hmm. stays home all day, right? Even I think we've learned it through the pandemic, like working from home by mm-hmm. yourself all day, it's isolating, right? And he's also right that like, I'll say women, but people who stay home with their children, yeah, they don't get raises. They don't get incidental praise. Like that's all true. And that's why he is so tricky, right? Because you're nodding along being like, yeah, right, right, right. But then it's like, oh, then there's that peace that comes right at the end. Yeah, it's the gender essentialism. Right. It's not that this is how we've structured our society and could structure it differently and better. It's this is how women are, uh-huh. period, inherently. And also because of the hierarchy that we've been talking about, this is how women should be. Yeah. If you're trying to find validation from outside sources, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. It's gross. But uh, it'll all be okay if she's just allowed to vent a little bit. Just a little bit. And pretend like you understand, even if if you don't. (laughs) You don't even really have to listen. Uh, Point number two, women can understandably get overwhelmed by keeping your house in order. Quote, most women will agree that the daily tasks of running a household can be managed. It is the accumulating project that break their backs. Periodically, someone has to clean the stove and the refrigerator, or replace the shelf paper, or wax the floors, or clean the windows. These kinds of cyclical responsibilities are always waiting in line for the attention of a busy mother and prevent her from ever feeling caught up. It is my belief that most families can afford to hire outside help to handle these projects. Oh. So that is his uh, solution to this. It's overwhelming to run a house. Again, that is a true thing. Yep. yep. His solution is hire somebody. Okay. I, I don't know that that'd be necessarily my first place to go, but I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it, but it is a privileged position yeah right like i think we know now that that's just not realistic for most people Mm -hmm. but okay my first line of thought would be hey husband help out with Uh, some of those things (laughs) (laughs) 
And again, not not everyone has the privilege, and and I, like there's extenuating circumstances, sure. But my first thought would not be get outside help. And I think one thing, unless he addresses it, that he's forgetting is that like men are off the clock at five o'clock or six o'clock at night. Mm. Women continue to take care of the home and be a mother 24 hours a day. Even and especially if there's uh, women are working and men are staying at home, there's something in feminist uh, literature called the second shift where why women will get home, assume the job of mothers and housewives, right. and then that becomes their job and then they don't really get time off. Right. Um, he also says, quote, It is my belief that a housewife will do a more efficient job than running a house and be a better mother if she can share the load with someone else occasionally. More explicitly, I feel like she should get out of the house completely for one day a week, doing something for the sheer enjoyment. This seems important to the happiness of the home, uh, more important to the happiness of the home, rather than buying new drapes or a power saw for dad. <laughs> and that part feels bad. It... He's saying a woman should be allowed out of the house one day a week and... Could do whatever she wants. She gets one day off. Yeah. Okay. I I don't like that it's... You, she'll be more efficient at doing her job. Yeah. <laughs> that feels dehumanizing to me. Yeah. It's like taking the car for a tune-up. Yeah. Okay. So I I read this next part, and I was on a spiral for days about this part. Oh, so, no. okay. So step one, identifying the problem correctly. Running a house for anyone is overwhelming. There's a lot to do, for sure. Solution, hire somebody. Okay, not the worst solution in the world. Feels kind of small and narrow. Here's how he suggests that women go out and get help. I can't wait. Quote, but how can middle class families afford house cleaning and babysitting services in these inflationary days? It can best be accomplished by using competent high school students instead of older adults. (laughs) I would suggest that a call be placed to the counseling office of the nearest senior high school. Tell the counselor that you need a mature third-year student to do some cleaning. Do not reveal that you are looking for a regular employee. When the referred girl arrives, try her out for a day and see how she handles the responsibility. The girl. Yeah. Trick a high school student into performing free or incredibly cheap labor for you. (laughs) Imagine this in 2023. Imagine I call a high school... At one o'clock in the afternoon and call the counseling office and say, hi, could you send me a junior to clean my house? (laughs) Could I please order your most competent junior high school student? Your most competent. Girl, please. Girl. (laughs) It's just, it's wild to me that his first answer to being a, a, running a home is hard is... Trick a high school trick a child <laughs> into performing free labor for you. Trick a girl. Yes. Yeah. Also, uh, the man shouldn't have much to do with it. It's a woman who should make the calls and screen them and vet them. Of course. More work for her. Um, we get the return of weirdly placed Q and A's at the end of oh, each good. chapter yeah, I like that those. are tangentially related. Um, he says women shouldn't get jobs, especially before their kids are in preschool, because they simply won't have the time to handle raising kids and working. Right. Again, the idea of a dad pitching in is not even no. considered. No. Um, you can let your kids be raised by babysitters or even worse, quote, government operated child care facilities. He really hates the idea of, quote, government run child care facilities. Oh, interesting. Which is really interesting to me because I think uh, government subsidized child care is actually a really good thing. Not just for stay-at-home moms or parents, but just kind of generally. Well, he doesn't like it because it threatens the role of the woman, right? It mm-hmm. allows her to go to work. Absolutely. He does say, you don't have to have kids. What? Has a little, has little nicety in there. My strong criticism is not with those who choose non-family lifestyles for themselves. Rather, it is aimed at those who abandon their parental responsibilities after the choice has been made. Oh. Um, which, okay, that's... <laughs> Better than it could be, I suppose. Again, with a slippery language, though. Non-family lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two married people are a family. Uh, a really tight group of friends can be a chosen family. This is something that queer spaces have known forever. Right. Nope, that's non-family. Only no, no. family is a nuclear family. Right. Yeah. Interesting. I wonder why that's okay with him. Um, 
I don't think it really is. No. Um, I think it's just kind of paying lip service to be like, my focus is this. I'm not really talking about you over here. Okay. I think he has his own criticisms of those who choose to forgo having children. Uh-huh. Uh, but also, again, not gay people who adopt kids. That's bad. <laughs> uh, number three and four were tied, according to Dobson. Loneliness, isolation, and boredom as one. Tied with absence of romantic love in my marriage. Mm. Dobson takes this and extrapolates it to say women are saying to him, I don't like myself. I have no meaningful relationships outside of my home, and I'm not even close to the man I love. Quote, feelings of self-worth and acceptance, which provide the cornerstone of healthy personalities, can only be attained from one source. Self-esteem is only generated by what we see reflected about ourselves in the eyes of other people. I don't actually know how to feel about that point. I think I disagree, but I'm really interested in hearing your perspective of that. I want you to say it again. Yeah. Um, da, da, da. self-esteem is only generated by what we see reflected about ourselves in the eyes of other people. False. Tell me more. I think self-esteem can be affected by how we see ourselves through the eyes of other people, for mm-hmm. sure. I don't think it is only affected yeah. by that. I would say significantly. Yeah. Depending on the person and the context, probably a lot. But Yeah. But I think uh, it is possible to certainly have low self-esteem even when surrounded by people who think highly of you Mm -hmm. right and in my coming out i my coming out was actually an act of loving myself Mm -hmm. no one around me particularly liked me at that time no my self-esteem got better when i surrounded myself with people who liked me and celebrated me and accepted me but it wasn't the hardest part for me coming out when my self-esteem was the lowest was before that when i was in the church when theoretically people liked me Right. Six reasons why women are isolated. Again, just according to Dobson, not according to, like, anything else. <laughs> well, reason number one, he thinks they should only be allowed out of the house one day a week. Like a zoo animal. Kind of. <laughs> uh, small children isolate a mother. That is true. Yeah. Society is not built with small kids in mind. I think that's a real critique. Yep. He takes it to a weird and creepy place, though, as we've come to expect from Jimmy Dobbs. (laughs) Women are trained to see everyone as a kid. And then he tells the story of a mom going out for a fancy dinner for the first time in a while and being seated next to some, like, president of her husband's company. Uh, And she realized, quote, with dismay that throughout their entire conversation, she had been dutifully cutting the president of her husband's company. Is that true? His food and wiping his mouth with her napkin. (laughs) I suppose you could call this a homemaker's occupational hazard. Dobson, what the fuck? First of all, that did not ever happen. That's just a parable. That is also like, I'm sorry because I'm going to use this word, but like that is like psychotic. <laughs> like if you were out to dinner and someone started cutting up your meat and wiping your face, that is not because, oh, she's a mom. That's because she needs some immediate mental health care. Like... That never happened. Yeah, and also the president of the company just sitting there and taking it the whole time? <laughs> I mean, excuse me, what the fuck, personal space? I mean, that is like the the wildest. I knew you were going to say it too. I was like, it's going to be cutting up the meat. Yeah. Ew, Jimmy. Ugh. Uh, reason number two that women are isolated. Women are mean to each other. Oh, come on. Which, okay. okay. All right, all right. Well, well, okay. All right, all right. Sure. Yes. But that is, that is totally designed, Mm -hmm. right? Because women are fighting to get to the top of the patriarchy. Women, well, let me clarify, white women. A lot, yeah. View themselves as second, right? They're, They're this close. And they want to align with number one, men, right? And when they can align with number one, then they are that much closer to the top. And to align with men is to hate women. Mm -hmm. It's men who hate women. It's men who are mean to women. And women model this to try to stay near the top. Reason number three, women are isolated. Feelings of inferiority serve to isolate women from each other. Take the gendered component out of that. Okay. If we're accepting this kind of model of Adlerian psychology, inferiority, That can make sense. Inferiority causes isolation, and isolation causes inferiority. That can be a significant feedback loop. Don't know why we need to make it gendered, but sure. Number four, fatigue and time pressure isolate mothers. Sure. Five, financial limitations. 
He doesn't have a lot to Those are also chapters in here, so he doesn't yeah. have a lot to say about them. But that's also just people. Yeah. Like, financial concerns isolate people. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, you are, yes. Including I'm, wives and mothers, but also all people. Uh, there's so much of this where I'm like, that's a fine point. Why is this gendered? Why right. is this about whatever? Yeah. Um, and this one, this one's my favorite. Women are less successful in finding outside interest and activities than are their masculine counterparts. Well, I would 100% agree when they are only allowed out of the house one day a week and when they are expected to be at home. What is he talking about? Oh, I have, I have, I have quotes. Quote, men love sporting events and draw great enthusiasm from following the games. Women do not. Men like to hunt and fish and hike in the wilderness. Women stay at home and wait for them. Men like to build and fix things and work in the garage. Women remain inside, washing the dishes. Men usually lack the time to pursue all their varied interests, while wives may find it difficult to generate much genuine enthusiasm for anything. Okay. I suspect that the cultural influences of early childhood stamp a certain passivity on little girls, constricting their field of interests. <gasps> Come back to that in just one second. For proof of this fact, listen to the conversations of the women next time you are at your social gathering. The feminine discussion will probably center around children, cosmetics, and other people's behaviors. The men will talk about a much greater variety of topics. Oh. How does he know this? Because he's listened to women in... in Let me tell you. I'm not going to tell you. But when a bunch of women get together and start talking, Mm -hmm. it's not about cosmetics. That's what I was thinking. Like, Dobson, you've clearly never heard... You've never been friends with any woman, if that's your experience (laughs) of women. That is for sure not... I mean, we might also talk about cosmetics... But that is not what's going down. Mm-mm. Nope. I want to go back to, uh, I suspect the cultural influence of early childhood stamp a certain passivity on little girls. That's the patriarchy. Yeah. That is sexism. Yes. You are so close, Dobson. Everything he says is exactly right until it goes, Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, he's right. It does. I talk about this with my clients all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, where did you first learn this? It was when you were a baby. Mm-hmm. Like, you have been submersed in this your entire life, so of course you can't break out of this easily. The lack of intellectual curiosity on behalf of Dobson is astounding to me. Literally, literally, all you have to ask is, why? Right. What is that passivity? Why does that happen? Why does it happen to girls? And then you get into actual feminist critiques of this. He's so disinterested in that. Right. Categorically incapable of it. So those are six reasons why women feel isolated from... Uh, the world. Uh He then goes in to talk about emotional differences between men and women in this. Men derive self-esteem from being respected. Women feel worthy when they are loved. This may be the most important personality distinction between the sexes. Do you not need to be loved? Do I not need to be respected? That's what I'm saying! Like, why is there this... Why is it one thing? There are no citations for this obviously fake fact. (laughs) I was told this. This was something that my dad told me and my older brother while we were being raised about the differences between men and women. Really? Men need to be respected. Women need to be loved. It's actually a pretty, like, common... When you're talking about gender essentialism in evangelical spaces, that's one of the, like, go-to things. And your critique is absolutely correct. Men also need to feel loved. Women also need to feel respected. Right. These are just universal human needs. Yeah, and then what also gets tricky is that men then feel they are entitled to respect. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and that love is a gift. And that love is a gift. I'm being kind to you by showing you love. Yes. Continue. Yes. No, that's it. And women have to fight for love, mm-hmm. right? And I think then that we also get into like, uh, well, whatever. But I think there's an idea that like sex is love, right? Or like uh, all the, whatever. There's a whole chapter about sex. We're going <gasps> to... Get into it. I hate him so much. I hate him. It's going to be gross. I hate him. Ew, he's going to talk about sex. Mm. Is that happening tonight? Oh, yeah. With a lot of detail. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. God. Okay. We're going to talk more about this at the end as well, but he does not paint men in a particularly good light. This is kind of a summary of what he says, but men view marriage as a business agreement that includes sex. Women need romance in relationships. Men would be totally fine if there's no romance as long as they get a fuck. But I guess women with their needs need romance and softness, I guess. That's so interesting. I have found that uh, quite a few men need romance. 
Yes. Yeah. There's been a number of times where I'm writing this where I will be like starting my rebuttal. And I'm like, well, one, I'm gay. And two, I'm not technically a man. So right. I guess he's not writing about me. But again, this idea of not only are these universal truths, according to Dobson, they're also aspirational. Right. If as a man, you feel like you need more love, maybe you're just being a bit of a pussy. <laughs> And, and if women are demanding respect, they need to stay in their fucking lane. Militant. Yeah, then they're being militant. Yeah. Interesting. After correctly identifying problems that some women face, he explains how patriarchy can fix loneliness by creating more romantic love in the relationship. <laughs> a man... Patriarchy has romance. Yeah. Good. A man as the head of the household must do more to show his wife love. Not make meaningful relationships outside of the marriage. He just needs to say nicer things to her more often. <laughs> Quote, it is clear that the husbands bear the initial responsibility for correcting the problem. This obligation is implicit in the role of leadership assigned to males. Oh. After taking a short detour to talk shit about polyamory, Dobson gives advice for how women should talk to men. Because yeah, He talks men... about polyamory? Yeah. He hates it. Unsurprisingly. I mean, bleh. There was a book uh, around this time called Open Marriage that I think introduced polyamory into the general populace, uh, and he does not like it. I, I have not read the book. I cannot critique it. I'm sure it's not great. Yeah, I'm sure. But then he gives advice for how women should talk to men, because men bear the initial responsibility, but women, you need to know how to talk to them. It's your responsibility to right. be heard, right? Right. Definitely not men's responsibility to listen. <laughs> First, a woman who wants to reignite the romantic fires in her husband must look for ways to teach him about her needs. Teach, not nag. I knew it would be all her fucking job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Timing. Select a moment when your husband is typically more responsive and pleasant. <laughs> Setting. The further you can get him away from home with its cares and genuine stresses, the better your chances will be to achieve genuine communication. And manner. Let it be known that you are attempting to interpret your needs and desires, not his inadequacies and shortcomings. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. This is like, this is reminding me of uh, Cosmo magazine in the 90s. Mm. Like big time, right? Like how to make a man love you. Mm -hmm. It's right? all your responsibility. It's all your responsibility. Wear this lipstick. Say these things. Watch him play his video games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell him his dick's big. Tell him his dick's big. Yeah. None of these are bad per se, but it's weird that it's only about how women can communicate with their husbands. This book seemingly written for men. Men are not asked to change here at all, or really ever, other than, quote, be nicer to your wife. That's about the extent of the change, but women have to watch their tone, their manner, their timing, what they say, how they say, make sure they're not nagging, but, but being affirmant, like all of this, it's all the women's responsibilities. I put this in here just so when we call him a feminist, we know exactly what we're doing. Please do not associate me with those contemporary voices which are mobilizing feminine troops for an all-out sexual combat. Which, side note, sounds very fun. <laughs> Nothing is less attractive to me than an angry woman who's determined to grab her share one way or another. No, the answer is not found in hostile aggression, but in quiet self-respect. And we're all very concerned about being a woman that's attractive to James Thompson. Oh, God, please. He's interesting the way that he aligns feminists with men. Mm -hmm. like combat and battle and militant and grabbing and taking, right? Like all of the things that he respects in men, mm -hmm. right? That's really interesting. And uh, I just I hate him so much. He's the worst. Yeah, he really is. There's another quiz in this book. He started the with Can the you ten. Give me the quiz? Oh yes, the the true false statements. But so okay. he starts this book with these list of ten things. He has you rank them, and then he tells you the order, and that's the rest of the book. Within this ranking, there's another quiz because he's a bad writer and has no original <laughs> ideas. Okay, Brooke, true or false? Yeah, I believe people who are sincerely in love with each other will not fight or argue. Well, Dobson believes that. Tell me your per your perspective as a person. Oh, me. Yeah. Okay, say it again. I believe people who sincerely love each other will not fight or argue. False. I believe God selects one particular person for each of us to marry, and he will guide us together. False. I believe that it is not harmful to have sexual intercourse before marriage if the couple has a meaningful relationship. Tricky, but true. Sure. Yeah. I believe teenagers are more capable of genuine love than our older people. <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you uh, only agreed with Dobson on the first one. I believe that people who are genuinely in love with each other will not fight or argue is false. Dobson says that's also false. Okay, good. Yeah. He does believe that God selects one particular person for each of us to marry. How could there just be one person? Uh, so as a marriage and family therapist, I believe that there are people that are a better fit for you. Sure. But soulmates are not found, they are made. You right. need to invest in a relationship. And you could make a meaningful relationship with, theoretically, a number of people work. It's about who you choose, who you invest time in. I, I reject wholeheartedly the idea of the one for anyone. It's also about where you are, right? Yeah. Like, the person who would have been the one for me when I was 21 is certainly not the one for me at 44. Mm -hmm. Like, it is about who you are and how you've evolved and what growth you've had in your own life, right? Mm -hmm. And then how you grow together. But I certainly feel like there are lots of people that would be compatible with me in a lot of different ways. And hopefully I would find those people throughout my life or learn about who those people would be or what they would be like. Nope, there's just one and God picked them. <laughs> Good luck. God, out of 7 billion people, I got to find this one? There's... It's kind of a meme at this point, but uh, in especially young evangelical circles, the idea of like, hey, I think God's calling us to date each other. <laughs> and that's like a pickup line. And the amount of times I had friends when I was an evangelical say like, I'm pretty sure God picked this person for me to marry. That's why I was allowed to date a girl. My parents did not want me to date. I had to prove to them that I thought God genuinely wanted me to marry this woman before I was allowed to even date her. Oh my it's so weird to think of you being... I was 15! <laughs> yeah, 15. I... It, it hurts my brain to think that I, because of our age difference, which doesn't really come into play very often, that there was a time in this world where I was a full-grown adult, like, watching strippers at Sidetrack while you were still this evangelical preteen. I came out less than 10 years ago. <laughs> Yeah. That's so weird. Wait, where was I? Oh my God, I was already in my full ass 30s. I believe that it's not harmful for sexual intercourse before marriage if the couple has a meaningful relationship. I don't think it's harmful even if you don't have a meaningful relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was what was tricky about it. <laughs> sometimes you find yourself in a glory hole, but sometimes <laughs> in a glory hole, you find yourself. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Mom. <laughs> And I believe teenagers are more capable of genuine love than older people. You said yes. I mean, I'm being a little facetious. Sure. But, like, maybe not genuine love, but, like, certainly romantic love, mm -hmm. right? Like, teenagers do everything more romantically and passionately than adults do because we're tired. Mm -hmm. But, like, I don't know. I'm being silly a little with this one. But go sometime and watch teenagers put on a play <laughs> when they've just discovered theater uh -huh. and 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 they are so earnest and it is the biggest night of their like fucking lives right this is how it feels to have your first kiss this is how it feels to have, i mean not for everybody but like yeah i think it is and and you have you don't have a history of people behind you that you've that you've dated and like had breakups with and shit it's all new and fresh and young and beautiful and you know someone's having a midlife crisis <laughs> <laughs> someone got jaded uh -oh. but it, i i think so so no i don't really think like true love because that's more complicated but i think romantic love i think it depends on what we mean by love one yeah. of the the things about my time as an evangelical that i actually really appreciate is uh there's like 20 different words for love in ancient Greek. Yeah. And that actually helped me understand a little bit of difference, but like, what do we mean when we say love? There is like new passionate romantic love. There's also like earned lifetime. I've been married to you for 50 years and you know what my shit smells like. So now there's like deep types of love, friendship, mm. love, family, love, like all these we call love. They all mean different things. If you find the person God made for you, you should court and then get married. You don't have to love them at first. Love is something you grow into. This I is a, a. I don't agree with that. He's talking about arranged marriages. Yeah. He's advocating for arranged marriages. This is that the the dill. What are they? The dillies? The da the daggers? The duggers? Duggers. The duggers. This is the duggers thing again. He doesn't use the words arranged marriages, but that's in practice what he's proposing. Um, he, so you talked a lot about like new love and firsts, and that's exciting. Dobson 
would agree, but he would say that needs to happen in the context of marriage. Right. 18-year-olds generally should not get married. Listen, watch those episodes of the Duggars where they start courting each other. And it's like they're holding hands like they are fucking. Like, because they are teenagers and they just want to touch another teenager. Mm -hmm. They will marry whoever you stick in front of them because they want to have physical human romantic touch. Mm -hmm. So then they're all married by the time they're 19 or whatever. But it is, it is wild watching the way that they sort of like crave you've never seen such filthy hand holding mm. in your life uh when i was an evangelical we made the difference between mittens and gloves oh yeah if you hold the hands as the mittens that you can be like interested but only only <laughs> when you are dating you get that hot glove action <laughs> fingers intertwined did you date some young ladies i dated what? two three mm, two and a half you did the first girl i ever kissed is a lesbian Good job, you two. I know. We found each other. Um, <laughs> there is just one person for each of us. And then the other two were in high school. One was uh, not... She was a Catholic, so she wasn't really a Christian. Uh-huh. And the other one was the evangelical girl that I had to wait six months to date. Uh, Your parents loved her, didn't they? They did. Yeah. Uh, we will actually... I have I have a plan to read a book not written by Dobson, but influenced him, all about courting and dating that was incredibly influential called I Kissed Dating Goodbye. <laughs> okay, uh, wait, one more thing. Can I tell you? Did you know that, um, what's his name? Kirk Cameron. Did you know that he was in a movie where he had to get married at the end? They said, you may now kiss the bride. And they, they for that shot, pulled the actress out and put his wife in. So it's his wife's lips that they show him kissing. Brooke, I've seen that movie. <gasps> Brooke, that movie is called Fireproof, and it is a crash fire of a movie. It is horrible. It's theoretically about saving your marriage, but it's all about how you need to financially invest in your wife, and she's a good financial investment. Oh my god! Yeah. So yes, I'm very well aware of that. That's that was given to me as a story of how you need to be committed to your spouse. Oh my god. Gross. Um, Gross. This chapter ends with, why are men so uninformed about romance? Yeah, why? They haven't been told. Oh, by women. What I've been attempting to say is that a woman's need for emotional fulfillment is just as pressing and urgent as the physiological requirement for sexual release in the male. So as much as men need to fuck, man, that's how much women need you to love them. Wow. Which is just gross. It is just gross. It ends with a quote that I think is interesting when we're talking about patriarchy. Someone once said, a woman wants a man she can look up to, but one that won't look down on her. That quotation is very old, but it has weathered the women's liberation movement and is still rather accurate. I, I actually don't hate it, but it doesn't have to be gendered in that way. I want someone who I can look up to. I want my partner to have amazing attributes that maybe I don't sure. have or does something better than me, but doesn't look down on me for that. I mean, so far, that's this whole book. It's like how people would like to be treated, mm-hmm. right? I mean, for the most part, it's like, yeah, romance, love, respect, don't be an asshole, mm-hmm. let me out of the house one time a week. But like, I don't, it's like, because he's only asked women, right? Then the, then these are now women's problems. Mm-hmm. He didn't ask the, you know, 60 husbands at the church what their problems are. It's like, these are just people problems. Number five on the list, financial difficulties. Oh, right. This one is short. Dobson says the way to uh, address your financial difficulties is to be less materialistic. <laughs> Women be shopping. Yep. Quite literally, he says, you do not need an electric can opener. Oh, God. That's, yeah. I'm going to fall on the floor and die. The The second half of this chapter, it's not a super long chapter, but the second half is a basically unrelated uh, just rant about how much he hates astrology. <laughs> what does that have to do with finance? I don't think it does. It doesn't really. It just, he doesn't have a and a so he had to go off on some other rant. I'm not here to shit on anyone's spiritual beliefs. You like astrology, that's fine. I hope you find meaning in it. But a lot of his gripes about astrology could be said to him verbatim about his beliefs in Christianity. Specifically, quote, one serious concern is that it, astrology, offers a substitute for rational judgment and wisdom. <laughs> my guy. My dude. Yes. <laughs> Look in the mirror. The call's coming from inside the house. <laughs> oh, my God. But, oh, but what, why is this in the financial stress section? It 
I, I think the, the segue literally is like, I have something else I want to talk about. Okay. Yeah. Or people have been making financial decisions based on their horoscope, and that's oh, been a problem. Oh, oh, okay. Some, like, very big connection. I lo- would love it if he was like, I really hate astrology, and wrote a whole thing, and he was like, especially Virgos. Fuck Virgos. <laughs> of course, you have to make it about you. What a Virgo thing to do. <laughs> um, again, he makes... And this chapter, astrology stuff aside, makes a rather salient, if somewhat juvenile, critique of capitalism. They were constantly fed a barrage of advertising telling us that we are inferior because we don't have all the things. Right. But he views this as a problem of the heart, not a systemic problem, and cannot criticize capitalism. (laughs) It's your fault that you feel like you need to own an electric can opener. And now it's time for, say the songs with Larry. No, now it's time for the best chapter, Sexual Problems in Marriage. I just wrote for this one, men have pee-pees and girls have hoo-hahs. <laughs> there is so much gender essentialism in this chapter. It's all about men want this, women want this, and they're, yeah. they're dichotomous. It starts with uh, the critical differences between men and women. Men are excited by visual stimulation. Women are stimulated by a sense of touch. Um, wrong. No citations. Right. <laughs> He's like... Shirley <laughs> is excited by Shirley's touch. all about the nips, but <laughs> so I do kink professionally. I am a sex therapist generally. I have friends who are sex nerds. One of my friends uh, did an experiment on himself. This person has a penis, and so attached a, a blood not full blood pressure cuff like goes on your arm, but similar concept to their penis, and tracked their blood flow and what turned them on or or not and they isolated each one of their senses to see actually what turned them on and for this person it was sound sound was the most erotic thing to them unless you're doing an experiment like that on a mass scale james dobson you cannot just state that up top what are you talking about right men are attracted to bodies women are attracted to the people inside what what right where did you come up with this it's just made up yeah like some sure sure i guess Fine. Yeah. And other people know. There's a, a an intimacy inventory that you get a lot of the couples that I see in couples therapy. And one of the questions is literally, which of the five senses is most erotic to you? To touch, to taste, to smell? Yeah. Because pe- everyone experiences sex differently. It may be, I do not believe so, but it may be that in general, people assigned male at birth are more visually oriented than women. I'm open to that possibility. Show me the studies, and then we can talk. Yeah, I mean, maybe. It also could be that they are conditioned to believe that, yes. right? To look at porn or to admire a female body or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. And women are not conditioned. It's like dirty or impure or wrong if you do that, right? So they are conditioned to receive love and receive touch, right? So the conditioning might say that. I don't know that it's necessarily true. No. Also, blindfolds exist, and men love blindfolds. Yeah. Hence, there's some validity to complaint by women that they've been used as sex objects by men. Some validity. <laughs> um, masculine self-esteem is more motivated by a desire to conquer a woman than he is becoming the object of her romantic love. These characteristics are well documented in the professional literature and then gives no citations. Whoa! Yeah. You can't just say shit like that. I mean, I guess you can, but like... That I would love it if I was in grad school and I was writing an APA paper and in parentheses I could just put well documented. <laughs> Citation me. <laughs> I don't believe this is an inborn characteristic. I do think it is socialized into men in a patriarchal system, this idea of domination and conquering women. Yes. I also think that's a problem. Yes. Dobson makes no such distinction and thus talks about men as if they are slaves to their primitive and lustful passions. Men just need to fuck. Men just see a beautiful woman and just instantly need to fuck her. It's not their fault. It's just how nature wired them. It also removes a little bit of culpability from men who Yeah, I was going to say, but it is her fault for being beautiful. Literally, women need to not... Something that was... Thankfully, I did not receive the most of this because I was assigned male at birth. But I heard so many times it is women's responsibility to dress modestly so they don't invoke the lust of men. They don't tempt the men. They don't cause them to stumble. It's their responsibility and fault. Yeah. Sex for men is more a physical thing. For women, it's about deeply emotional experience. Wrong. Not asking why. Not asking can this be changed or even is this good. Just it is. Also, no room for like both. No. Like sometimes 
Sure. Yes, sometimes no. And sometimes in one person it can be both. Right. People have sex for so many reasons. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, like there are times where it's deeply connecting and romantic and there's times you want to bone. Yeah. Or whatever. Quote, a man can come home from work in a bad mood, spend the evening slaving over his desk or in his garage, and watch the 11 o'clock news in silence, and finally hop into beds for some nighttime romp. The fact that he and his wife have no tender moments in the entire evening does not inhibit his sexual desire significantly. That makes me sad. <laughs> that makes me really sad for the men he's talking about. Yeah. Men, men actually do want to be soft and loved and gentle and... But also... That also happens to women. Mm-hmm. Like, women can get in bed after not connecting with their husband all day and have a little nighttime romp. And, like, it's, again, it's people. He's talking about people. Okay. He takes it a step further, though. I would specify the importance of romantic love to every aspect of the feminine existence. It provides the foundation for a woman's self-esteem, her joy in living, and her sexual responsiveness. Okay, so if you don't have romantic love, you don't have self-esteem. You have low self-esteem, low joy in living. Not necessarily none, but yeah. Okay. This is that horrifying thing that I have to like undo with all my clients where it's like, oh, you were raised to believe that like Disney princess life. Yes. Is, is marriage, kids, like that whole thing. Did you ever get asked if you want that? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Most of us need romantic love in our primary relationships. The fact that men reportedly have less of a need is a sign of how we've cut ourselves off from our own humanity for the sake of masculinity. It's sad. Also, a woman's self-worth should be wholly dependent on her romantic partner. Or anyone's. Uh, He does talk about some actual problems uh, in sexuality in relationships. One is variability in desire. This is known as desire discrepancy. Unsurprisingly, through this gender centralist lens, Dobson says that men are always going to want sex more than women, which is not true. And in fact, if a woman desires sex more than men in a relationship, there can be a lot of shame on all sides that she's being too slutty or he's not being sexual enough or whatever. The idea of like not being able to fulfill your, your woman's needs is a big source of shame for men. Being seen as a whore is a big source of shame for women. He said, quote, men hunger for sexual release more consistently than do women. This next quote sent me over the moon. Quote, When the sexual response is blocked, males experiencing an accumulating physiological pressure which demands release. Two seminal vesicles gradually fill to capacity. As the maximum level is reached, hormonal influence sensitizes the man to all sexual stimuli. Thus, the woman should recognize that the man's desire is dictated by the the definite biochemical forces within his body, and that if she loves him, (gasps) she will seek to satisfy those needs as meaningfully and as regularly as possible. So number one, Dobson is anti-blue balls. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please just describe my face to the to the listeners? Brooke is sitting here in kind of stunned silence, mouth agape, <laughs> eyebrows raised, eyes wide open, just kind of dissociating a little bit, staring <laughs> off to the side. It's basically like, if you love me, you'll suck me off. Yes. It provides space to condone marital rape. He does yeah. not talk about marital rape in here. He does not say it's necessarily your, uh, your. It's a man's uh, right to to have his wife's body whenever he wants. He no, but he does say that if you don't do this regularly, you don't love your husband. Yes, if you truly love him, you'll right. do whatever. Which men actually don't need to get off. If they don't, the body has a way of relieving that pressure. Wet dreams. Also, you can just masturbate, even without porn. That's fine. He doesn't talk about masturbation. I have a feeling he's against it. But, like, masturbation is healthy. Also, if your partner is not wanting to have sex, you're not going to die. You'll be fine. You'll be horny, I guess. I know people who don't, who put themselves in chastity, a literal, like, device on their dick that they cannot use for fun on, like, days on end. They're fine. You'll be fine, too. He doesn't talk about masturbation because he knows that you have to masturbate because he masturbates because he's a human person everyone does unless you're asexual. most people do it is incredibly common for people even with the most strict uh, internal religious codes do yeah yeah also not masturbating has no health effects this is a side tangent but like no fap is a bunch of bullshit if you don't want to masturbate for your own life that's fine that's a choice you get to make sure but you're not like gaining any health effects from it right Again, this paints men in such a gross light driven only by definite biological or biochemical forces within his body. 
it's just it's just gross all around. He's so gross. Um, and then this quote, I think, is about me specifically. The vast majority of America's sex therapy clinics are operated by frauds, charlatans, and outright quacks. Yeah! That's me! My little duckling, you are an outright quack. Quack, quack! <laughs> That's for you, Jordan. <laughs> oh, we love you, Jordan. Um, desire discrepancy is a real thing. Yeah. People do want sex in different amounts in relationships. There's ways to overcome that. The way to overcome it is not a person who wants sex less. Whenever your partner wants sex, give it to them. That can be a little bit of a potential solution that could be one bit. Not whenever, but okay. I don't want to have sex, but my partner does, and I can be okay with having sex with them. That can be a choice that you make, but it cannot be the only solution. Right. Ideas like masturbating more or finding other ways of engaging in sexual pleasure or even potentially non-monogamy so that a person who has a high sexual need or a specific sexual need can get that met elsewhere can be okay. Right. Problem two, another uh, common inhibitor to women is lack of cleanliness by their husbands. Dobson said straight men need to be taught to wash their asses. And honestly, yeah. Yeah, not going to argue that. That's fair. That's a true point. <laughs> He's right. I, okay. Dobson was right about one thing. You get one. You get one. Mm-hmm. And problem number three, media is intentionally trying to discourage women from being mothers for unclear reasons. Yeah. Quote, to sell the idea of a mother, being a mother means you are being cheated, bored, exploited, and wasted as a human being. To sell the idea that being a mom is a bad thing, women are cast as policewomen, surgeons, newspaper editors, or anything else that, than wives and mothers <laughs> in media. This is just like a weird victim complex of like increasing representation of women in other roles than being moms and wives means that they're denigrating being moms and wives. Right. Which is not inherently true. No. That's so twisty. Yeah. His solution is to take away freedom of the press. Oh, that, that works, yeah. To make a central office which would register complaints and force media to change. And then... He's just like unhinged grandpa. Mm-hmm. America's weird, creepy uncle. Yeah. And then he goes on our first full-on rant against queerness. <gasps> oh, God. And it starts with a quote that I think you will particularly enjoy. Okay. The cover of a recent Cosmopolitan magazine oh. posed the question... Is bisexuality thinkable or even doable for non-nutcases? <laughs> Get those nuts away from my case. I need that cover of that <laughs> I need it framed in my office. I think we can find it. I think we can Google it. Let's... Okay, yeah, we need to find that. I... That is incredible. That's amazing. Wait, say it again. Is bisexuality thinkable or even doable for non-nutcases? <laughs> What a freak. That's so good. He has an anecdote. Quote, a recent television program aired in Los Angeles on Saturday morning, a time when the greatest number of children are watching. Four aggressive lesbians were featured. (laughs) They were not only discussing their sexual preferences, they were advocating female homosexuality with all the militant enthusiasm they could generate. Is it any wonder why homosexuality is considered contagious? It spreads, and this kind of publicity is the vehicle for its propagation. What program was he discussing? I probably, just like a Jerry Springer, I'm sure. Like just a talk show or whatever. Uh-huh. A couple very gross things. One, this is kind of a tangent. I don't like that we use the frame sexual orientation to talk about being queer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like to have sex with dudes, but I'm, more, I'm gay not just because who I like to put my penis inside. I identify as gay because I was assigned male at birth and I want to build a life with another guy. I'm romantically involved in them. I have a boyfriend that that is what makes me gay more so than who i put my dick in right but number two and more importantly this idea of homosexuality being a contagion yeah that is a very old school homophobic trope and has been used to justify incredible acts of violence against queer people if we let you out if we let you exist at all it will spread and infect our children and you need to recruit them because you can't reproduce and all this other bullshit as opposed to queerness just being a variation of the normal human experience so if he hates homosexuality, he hates bisexuality. Oh, he really hates it. You nutcase. Good. Yeah. Oh, I am a nutcase. It is. Let me tell you something, James. It's doable. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said I'm doable. <laughs> well. <laughs> Jury's out. 
Number seven, menstrual and physiological problems. Oh, here we go. So this chapter, like I said, is not as bad as you would think. It's only 12 pages long. Okay. The the, the chapter about uh, how uh, it's women need to talk to men better is 30-something pages long. Okay. And in this one, he's basically just talking about the fact that women going through menopause may benefit from estrogen supplements. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's basically the point of the... His wife went through menopause, was acting all sorts of crazy, but as soon as she got estrogen supplements, she was fine. I mean, okay. Yeah, like I said, it's not as bad as you think. Thanks, Jimmy D, but like, we can... We, we can you're right, like, who is this book for? My, my quote, my, my note to this, there's two, it just says yes. <laughs> <laughs> and second, he's talking about hormone replacement therapy. Which is a typical prescription for women in menopause. That, that is a thing that it's proven to happen. And I guess back in 1975, it was less common as a prescription. But also, hormone replacement therapy can help a lot of people, not yeah. just women in menopause. And also, I'm, I gotta be honest, I'm kind of amazed he's talking about menopause at all. Because like, that's, that's what his wife went through. Yeah. And he can only understand women through the proximity of people he's talked to. Do you think Shirley Ghost wrote this? I cannot believe that she did. I don't think she would say these kinds of things. <laughs> he still is kind of gross about it, about how yeah. he talks about All it. Right, but like, true. It's, it's, I thought it was going to be like, bitches on their period be crazy, am I right? <laughs> and it's a little bit of that, but it's mostly like there are things you can do to help specifically women in menopause. I mean, thank you, but like, we don't really need James Dobson's help for that. Nope. No, we do not. So, Number eight, problems with the children. Which is just more about women's isolation. This, I think, gets to some of the things we identified and we're like, what, what is this about earlier? Quote, fathers are working long hours and moonlighting to maintain a decent standard of living. When they do come home, they are exhausted and have little energy left to invest in their loved ones. And so it is that many wives have the full responsibility for the care of their children. Doesn't critique this at all, just says as a fact. Again, this like essentialism, it's not a socialized thing, it's just how we are. How do you feel, he does a Q&A, how do you feel about a man doing his share of the housework and helping at the meals at home? Great. That's definitely expected and necessary. This is a quote from Dobson. I dislike seeing a man work all day at his job and then be obligated to, to confront his wife's responsibilities when he gets home. Personally, I buck when I think my wife is demanding that I go beyond the call of duty. I like to help her on a voluntary basis. Okay, I'm going to scream because I said this earlier. The man gets to leave work and go home. The woman then never gets to leave work. She just keeps working. Mm -hmm. Okay. He likes to make it seem a little bit better for himself. Quote, each evening that I am home, I oversee my kids' bedtime preparations, brushing teeth, administering the bath, putting on their pajamas, saying the prayers, and hauling (laughs) for several glasses of water to each little procrastinator. So, like, he's working too. Kind of. He gets to make an appearance in his children's life, be the good parent. Yeah. And while she's washing dishes and doing whatever. Yeah. And then, even once they're done with that, then they go to bed, and then she still has to work as a wife to give him sex, if that's not something that she's actively desiring. So, remember back when we were like, why is he saying the solution to being overwhelmed by housework is tricking a teenager into... And why not helping? Why not have the husband help? Because he literally rejects that outright as a solution. Men do not need to help more than they yeah. do. And helping the idea that you're helping, yeah, her. babysitting, babysitting. Men, what you're not I... babysitting your kids. You're watching your fucking kids. Yeah, those are your kids. Yeah, yeah. How could she help you with your kids? Yeah, that is, and like, yeah, that I I've had friends talk about that before, where they're even like progressive, like. People who are like, oh, yeah, like, my husband's like, how can I help you? It's like, this is your house. If you see a mess, clean it up. Mm -hmm. If you see a child screaming, shove something in its mouth. Like, figure it out. I mean, I think you can tell I don't have kids because I don't think you're supposed to just shove something in its mouth when it's crying. I mean, more or less. (laughs) Be specific with the thing. Make it like a, a child safe thing. Yeah, not like a hot dog. He then goes on to talk more shit about feminism. I don't know that we need to get into all of it, but he says, like, feminism asserts that it is impossible for a woman to be fulfilled when staying at home and raising children. Again, no citations. No, here. and that's not what they're saying. No. Patriarchy has forced women's value to be solely defined by motherhood, and that is bad. 
And also women deserve a choice in what they do with their lives. Yeah. Being a mom can be great. So can being single. So can be married. So can being a lesbian. So can being a CEO. Women deserve to choose what makes them happy and not be forced into any role. People. That's just feminism. Yeah. That's just like f- literally feminism 101. Yeah. Even even your like second wave feminism and its own gender essentialist shit. Yeah. If you actually listened, if you were curious at all about what they actually meant, that's pretty apparent. Yeah. He cites a real renowned sociologist named Bronfen Brenner, but takes away the wrong message from Bronfen Brenner's work. There's a quote from so Bronfen Brenner is actually oh yeah Bronfen Brenner. It's a person who I actually like really like as a sociologist. Has some really interesting ideas. It was my introduction into systemic thinking and viewing people in a broader context. Uh huh. The quote from Braun from Brenner is, With the withdrawal of the social supports for the family, the position of women and mothers has become more and more isolated. With the breakdown of community, the neighborhood, and the extended family, an increasing responsibility for the care and upbringing of children has fallen on the young mother. That's a fair, valid, salient critique. Braun from Brenner is correct. I, I like them a lot. Great job, Braun from Brenner. Dobson's solution is just to focus on strengthening the individual family, completely ignores community, neighborhood, or even extended family. It's all about making sure that we value wives and mothers more. And again, sure, that can be a valuable part, but the the hyper-individualization that comes with the nuclear family is ultimately the problem here. Right. We need to address that part, make us more connected, build more community and relationships that are meaningful. Dobson rejects that outright. And just as a side note, there's another Lee Harvey Oswald reference here. Stop it. He's obsessed with this guy. He loves all these guys. It's, okay. It's very funny to me. What does he say? Uh, just as an example of like a mother who's doing her job wrong will lead to a Lee Harvey Oswald. It's not that interesting on its own. He really is mad at Lee Harvey Oswald's mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's mentioned her a couple times. And then we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about patriarchy. It's kind of an overview, but I think this is very important. I don't want to minimize the vital role played by a mother. I believe that a successful family begins not with her, but with her husband. Of course. If his ego needs are not met, the whole family falls apart. He's the head of the house. Right. Number nine, aging. Oh, aging was one of the top concerns. I don't remember that. Mm-hmm. Women need monogamous lifelong marriages to experience, quote, a lifelong devotion. So they don't have to worry about aging or being unattractive. What? Uh, we're going to talk about this, kind of why he thinks so much about the nuclear family. But one of his ideas is that as you get older, you need someone who actually loves you and is able to validate that you are attractive to them, that they still love you. Because if you're a, an old widow, if you're an old maiden, <laughs> no one's going to watch you. No one's going to fuck you. Right. <laughs> you, <laughs> you scared me just now when you said that. Men need women and women need men. That's the way it's always been. And then cites Adam and Eve, who did not exist. Cites Adam and Eve like a, like a citation. Well, it says, like, we saw this in Adam and Eve. Right. And that's, yeah. In this story. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. He says it as if it's real. Young Earth creationism is what he's getting at here. The idea that Earth was literally made 6,000 years ago and Adam and Eve were literally the first people to exist. God literally made them. Noah's Ark is a literal thing that happened that flooded the entire world. All of which is completely untrue right and was never meant to be interpreted as that right it just goes with it he doesn't really spend a lot of time in young earth creationism but i will point it out here just to say that all of these things are tied together and reinforce a worldview of each other he says depression is often evidence of emotional surrender which i find to be particularly gross coming from a therapist yeah uh, emotional surrender mm-hmm. uh the last quote from this that i want to spend time with The family was designed by God Almighty to have a specific purpose and function. When it operates as intended, the emotional and physical needs of husband and wives and children are met in a beautiful relationship of symbiotic love. When the family is polluted through sexual permissiveness or selfishness, or incredibly busy lives, then disease replaces health and despondency sits at the front doorstep. The American family is sick today, and the widespread depression of which I have written about is but a symptom of that malignancy. Wow. The reason you're depressed is because families are bad. And that is as systemic as he gets in his critiques. Wow. I mean, we know we hate him, and we know he's an idiot, but like he's, he's dangerous. Yes. Yeah. That's the other reason I want to make this podcast. It's just not some fucking asshole who's saying shit. Right. It's that these have real-world implications, whether it be child abuse or mar- marital rape. Right. These things directly stem from his writings right 
That was actually the least. That's number 10 on the list. Number nine is in-law conflict. Oh, yeah. And he just doesn't talk about it at all. This <laughs> What does he say? What's the chapter? It, there's not even a chapter devoted to it. What? No. He just ignores it? Um, he says, I'll talk about it in a bit, and then never does. It <laughs> goes, menstrual problems, problems with children, and then aging. Oh, my God. And then the last word kind of to sum up. And then he just never talks about in-law problems. No. Okay. Can I see the book? So that's the book. Going through all of this, I want to revisit the question I posed up top. Brooke. Yeah. Who's the audience for this? Like, actually. I mean, it feels like it's supposed to be men. Mm -hmm. But I don't, but I don't understand. Ostensibly, yes. I would agree. Right? It's what wives wish their husbands knew about right. women. So it's the, like the complicated title says, what wives wished their husbands knew about women. So that implies that it's about men. No. He says verbatim, quote, Let's face it, only 20% of the readers of this kind of book are likely to be men. So he's writing this for women to be like, I see what you're doing. I know your problems, but also here's how you fix them, and it's all on you. I want you to know that the author photograph on the back is James Ann Shirley. Aw, they're so in love. This bitch is behind this. I'm sure she probably played a role. You picked up on some things that I think are really important to note. His use of language is important. He uses wife and woman and housewife pretty interchangeably. Yeah. But feminist is always some bra burning dyke type. Yep. And that is, those are the two types of women you're allowed to be. Yeah. The only time feminist ever got interchanged was with lesbian. Mm hmm. And then bisexual was just nutcase. So let's zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Why are these solutions so fucking bad? It's because Dobson cannot criticize capitalism or patriarchy. Right. So as we noted, he identified the correct problems a number of times. Yeah, women do, housewives, people who run houses generally do get overwhelmed by the amount of housework that there is to do. These chores just pile up. But the solution isn't then trick a teenager to go getting help, right? <laughs> the problem is not just that this exists. The problem is the systems that create it. But he cannot do that. And therefore he's forced into this weird corner with just the most bullshitty of bullshit excuses. Yeah, that's so right. In the previous book, he spent some time talking about how capitalism is the best system, and that really bleeds through to here. The pursuit of infinite growth, which is at the, the cornerstone of capitalism, that can always be improving, always being better, and you always need more profit, you always need to be increasing profit, is toxic for everybody. Infinite growth cannot feasibly exist in perpetuity. It is an impossible goal. And then also, in that model, you always have to be competing and competing, but you're not competing with fucking Bill Gates. I'm competing with you. Right. We're going for the same job. I don't care what Bill Gates is doing. There's one therapist position and there's two of us. So I got to cut you down. And therefore that feeds into this super hyper isolationist, hyper individualistic perspective of things. The only people that I'm not competing with are my family. Mm. And I can't be competing with my wife if she's working. Uh, she's got to be supporting me. Right. It also like gets into this like weird sexual anxiety. You need to reproduce in your family. Your kids need to take care of you and they need to be good uh, producers. It strikes me also that uh, the term cuck was used for a while as an insult. And that is, like, cucking is rooted in sexual fetish. A, a cuck is a sexual fetish who watches his wife be, uh, have sex with another man. Yeah. Typically, there's also a racial component to it. It's a white man watching his white wife be fucked by a black man. Oh. And that also gets into ideas of, like, the great replacement theory and stuff. Like, we're, we're seeing how racism and sexism and capitalism are all intersecting in these really gross ways. Your whole family, through this lens, is turned into a machine to best support you while you go produce and reward you with sex and validation and pride when you do. The nuclear family system was made to reproduce capitalism. Yep. Pretty explicitly, and Dobson supports that and validates that. Yes. It's gross. It's gross. I'm so stuck on what you just said. It's such a valid point, right? Like, when you can't blame patriarchy and capitalism then you just come up with these strange things because like you mentioned in the beginning, right? It's like, yeah, why do girls feel this passive like pressure? Why do like all of these things, right? It's all capitalism. It's all patriarchy. It's all reproducing this nuclear family. Yeah. It's all. F it's all fun of. It's all focusing <laughs> on the family. But, and actually that's a good point to this, the other part of this that I wanted to talk about before we go fully broad, which is his definition of family. Yeah only includes the nuclear family. 
choosing not to have kids does not mean you don't have a family. But to admit that, to admit that having a family can look like a thousand different ways to a thousand different people, completely undermines his entire worldview of gender, religion, government, and hierarchy. There's a lot of language of like, kids need a mom. Moms are great. I love my mom. I do think there are certain things that only a mom, a woman can offer. Sure. But not having a mom in your life isn't on its own inherently bad. There's, it's interesting because there are so many types of families, even within his his value system, mm-hmm. right? So obviously he's not going to support lesbian moms or, you know, chosen families in queer communities. But like, yeah, what about single moms where a father is in the military or has died, right? Like, what about uh, grandparents who live in the families, right? Like all these things where his value system would technically condone it, but it's not the nuclear family. And those are seen as a step down from the nuclear family. Uh, it cannot be that relatives raising you, you can live an equally happy, fulfilled, meaningful, connective life. I mean, you can through Dobson's lens, but like, it'd be better if you didn't. Yeah. And I just think that that's gross. Yeah. So now I want to zoom out even more broadly, and let's talk more about Dobson's beliefs just generally. Yeah. And there's this is kind of a long quote, but I think this is a really good place for us to kind of like wrap up with, and this is all about the nuclear family. Why is he so focused on that? Quote, Why do you suppose the reproductive urge within us is so relevant to cultural survival? It is because the energy which holds the people together is sexual in nature. The physical attraction between men and women causes them to establish a family and invest themselves in its development. It is this force which encourages them to work and save and toil to ensure the survival of their families. The sexual energy provides the impetus for raising healthy children and for the transfer of values from one generation to another. It urges a man to work when he'd rather play. It causes a woman to save when she'd rather spend. In short, the sexual aspect of our nature, when released exclusively within the family, produces stability and responsibility that would not otherwise occur. When a nation is composed of millions of devoted, responsible family units, the entire society is stable and responsible and resilient. If the sexual energy within the family, which is the key to a healthy society, its release outside those boundaries is potentially catastrophic. The very forces which bind people together then becomes an agent for its own destruction. And then he goes off to talk about how when you look at the nucleus of an atom, it's the same thing. And evangelicals love doing this. They take a thing in nature and be like, metaphorically, it's the same, whatever. I think that that's really interesting, though. At the core of Dobson's beliefs, at the core of all of these interlocking hierarchies between slavery and patriarchy, white supremacy, the nuclear family system, it's the sexual tension that drives everybody. And that is such a weird, like, Freudian way of looking at things. Yes. That your whole family is structured around sexual energy. Yeah. I, I like sex. Sure. I'm pretty sex positive and sex liberated my entire life. As, as a sex therapist who does a lot of kinky shit, does not revolve around sex. That is not the main driving force in my life. Right. I reject this claim outright. and I think it says a lot more about Dobson than it does about humans generally. Yeah. And also, I want to get my brain around this a second. Because what he's saying is the sexual attraction that a man has for a woman and that a woman returns, well, her romantic attraction, I guess, can create this family, pass down the values, blah, blah, blah. Why would that be different for a gay couple? Because they can't actually reproduce. Oh, right. I think, obviously, the logic is flawed. And when you start saying, if this, why not this, it kind of all falls apart. Which is why Dobson doesn't get into these things. It's why he paints militant feminists in such a, like, all bad, they have no points, anything. Because if you allow any of these critiques to creep in, then it all falls apart. This was actually my deconstruction story. I, when I realized, oh shit, I'm real gay, (laughs) I don't understand why the love that I might have for another man is fundamentally any different or less pure than the love I would have for a woman. That just doesn't make, the way that you're talking about love being sacrificial and motivating and lustful and all these things that like theoretically evangelicals say is what makes a good marriage, I could do that with another dude. Right. Your logic falls apart here if what, if what matters is, is that sexual tension to reproduce values and whatever. That can exist here. You cannot question that logic because then yeah. it all falls apart. It yeah. cannot let even a, a gasp in. Yeah. Yeah, and that's when all you can do is return to religion and say it's 
wrong. Mm -hmm. But you can't really ever point to why. If you're going for simple answers, which is what evangelicalism specifically provides, here's a hierarchy, here's answers, you don't need to think more. There's some comfort in that. But the minute you don't fit into that, the minute you start questioning that, you're either reprimanded and forced to fit back in or kicked out. There's no room for disagreement here. I want to end uh, with just a little bit of uh, talking about how patriarchy is bad for guys too. Yeah. We've talked about this throughout it. Um, but instead of saying all the ways that it's bad for men, I want to I want to talk to all the men in the audience, if you're listening. What Jake wishes their husbands knew about patriarchy. <laughs> I can barely handle one boyfriend, let alone multiple husbands. <laughs> You don't have to work yourself up into weird, misogynistic knots to respect women. Dobson has a podcast worth of logic trying to show why controlling women is a sign of respect. Treat women like equal human beings. It's really not that hard to do. As we've talked about here, a lot of the problems women face are problems men face too. If they have a problem, listen to them. It's okay to tap into your feminine side. It doesn't make you gay to like painting your nails or to cry or to watch RuPaul's Drag Race or fucking whatever. You are much more alike than you are different. The reason that I reject this gender essentialism is for a number of reasons, but I think by focusing on men are this, women are this, you ignore the fact that any actual differences that exist between men and women, one, it's really impossible to tell what's socialized and what's not, but two, those differences really aren't the most important thing. They're not the story here. You are much more alike than you are different. Your struggles are deeply intertwined. All of the problems identified as men's problems, a lack of emotional intimacy, intense pressure with being a provider, losing custody battles frequently, these are all problems that feminists see and think are bad as well. But by identifying men's issues, you can be a feminist. You just have to extend to be like, and women also have problems and they matter too. You're allowed to want softness. You're allowed to want romance. You're allowed to want to be submissive. You don't have to listen to creepy old fucks. You don't have to to listen to James Dobson. God damn, I hate James Dobson. (laughs) But I love you, James. (laughs) And I love you, Brooke. That was lovely. Any words from you as a resident woman? (laughs) Sorry. As our token woman. (laughs) Our diversity hire on this podcast. (laughs) I know, I have to go handle my period and my in-laws now. (laughs) Don't forget that electric can opener. (laughs) I Hate James Dobson is a labor of love. Written, recorded, edited, and produced by me, Jake. I'm honored to be joined in this project by my amazing co-host, Brooke. If you're enjoying the show, please consider rating and reviewing it. If you want to connect with us more, you can find us on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube at I Hate James Dobson, and on Twitter at I Hate J Dobbs. Special thanks to Drew, Lindsay, DJ, Jack, and Brooks. Our theme music is by Mood Maze, and the song is called Trendsetter. Thank you for enjoying the show. Mm-hmm.